Hello. Anybody out there? Hi Ed, thanks. Yeah, I had to restart because for some reason, even though it connected and told me everything was okay, nothing was appearing. It was very strange. Now, it's going to be a real pain for me moving forward, putting that back together. God, how annoying. It doesn't normally do that. It normally just reconnects. I don't know why it's, it wasn't... Because um, it reported here that it reconnected. But clearly it hadn't. Well, if it had, it wasn't showing everyone. How very annoying. I've not had that happen before. Normally it just takes care of itself, reconnects. You just get a break and then it's okay. <clears throat> uh, I can only see Ed at the moment, which is strange. Trouble is, I don't know if I can tell everybody. Will they see the chat? Just you and me, Ed, at the moment, mate. Which is very strange.
Sorry, folks, just waiting for people to join back. I could see a few people have rejoined the stream. So for some reason, the stream, although it said it automatically joined back. Hi, welcome back, Laurie. Although it's connected back, for some reason, you guys weren't seeing it. So I actually had to stop the stream and restart it. It's a real pain in there, but um, a couple of people have come back, but quite a few people are still there. I guess I should just continue, really. Did you have to refresh, Laurie? I refresh the page. Ah, okay. I think that's the trouble. If you stop, actually stop the stream, you shouldn't do that. You, normally, it just picks it back up. So if it disconnects, you get a warning from OBS saying it's disconnected. It actually detects that. And then it says reconnected. And then there's normally a bit of a delay. And then everyone just carries on as normal. But for some reason, even though it said it reconnected, the stream just didn't come up for people. Which is why I had to stop the stream and restart. Which is really frustrating. Very annoying. Anyhow, what I was going to do today was do some work on the Rev B of the, um, the alloy. Um, there, by the way, Laurie, um, I should show you where the... There is a, um, a repository for um, the next, i.e. the ECP5 board. Just in case you need to follow that. And that's currently being updated. Uh, that's a little bit behind the version I've got here, but um, we might actually have two flash chips, for example, on there. And I'm just trying to work out how to do the camera connections. The MIPI stuff is really driving me bonkers as well on that, Laurie. Uh, and I might, I'm not sure if I'm going to do that on the camera side. I might keep a MIPI part there for LCD displays, but might not, probably won't bother with doing the MIPI camera stuff. I'll just stick to things like uh, Pi cameras, Raspberry Pi type cameras rather than, you know, CSI cameras, rather than MIPI ones. Um, the, the, the problem with doing MIPI on the ECP5 is it doesn't have any native support for MIPI. So you have to use, because you need to support the low bandwidth and the high bandwidth. If you have an internal MIPI PHY, it does all this for you. But if you don't have, you have to use twice as many pins. So if you had a camera with, say, four lanes, plus a clock, five lanes, that's normally two pins for each lane, so that's 10. But you have to double that. That becomes like 20. Because you need to do the extra two to be able to do the low, 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 low frequency uh, modes. And it's just frustrating. Um, on the newer chips, that won't be an issue, but we're well, 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 way away from that. The new is it to Nexus cores? Um, pricing for those looks very similar to um, ECP5, by the way, when they actually get the damn things in stock, they've had trouble supplying those lattice. Um, Okay, 
Right, so I was going to work on a CAD. Did you want to ask me anything else about ECP5 and Amalgam whilst I'm at it, Laurie? Is there anything specific that you wanted to know about that? Right, so let me just switch to the... Uh, was there anything else on the community side that we need to... Um, uh, um, Surdays, do you mean the 5 gig? It won't have the 5 gig speed. Not on that chip. So it won't be able to do USB 3 or um, PCIe 2. It does have high speed differential, but, but you know, significantly lower rates than those. To, to do the high speed surdies, you need the um, you need to go for either the bigger or the smaller chips, depends. So this is the 256 ball, uh, 0.8 pitch BGA on the ECB5 on the Amalgam. You need to go to the 381 ball version if you want the PCIe, or you go down to the 0.5 mil pitch BGA. Um, and there is a couple of options down there as well. But that, the trouble is with going down to those is suddenly your um, your PCB costs really rocket up. And you have to, to, to break out all of the layers, I'm sorry, all of the, all of the uh, balls. You either have to create more layers or you have to start doing things like blind buyers or buyers in pads and stuff and that's that's a bit of a nightmare. Uh, yeah, it gives you the camera stuff, Laurie. Um, I don't know if you're using DRAM. I know the... Um, ULX uses SD RAM, whereas this will use DDR, um, DDR2 actually, DDR2 memory, um, maybe a bit more. Um, but the other thing is the format, of course. It's in black edge format. I don't know if that's important to you, Laurie. You know, I don't know if you gain from black edge type um, setup or not I don't know if that's important to you yeah that's right the orange crab does have 128 megs of DDR. Um, trouble is with the orange crab is you, it's it's kind of crammed into a, a feather format. It's not, it's not so much the cramming that's the problem. It's the fact that you're not getting many pins. 
Uh, I don't know. Does does that use the Surdis, the orange crab? I don't know how many people. Um, there is a board that I believe that Greg Deville is working on. Uh, that will have DDR RAM. It will also have gigabit Ethernet. Um, and it has a SysG. Is it the SysG type connectors on? I don't know if he's breaking out the Surdies on the on those. But he's added a high speed connector on the butter stick. Several of them. But I don't know if that contains the fast Surdies or not. Yeah, I don't really know what's happened about the tiny FPGA EX. I don't know, um, you know, what's happened about um, those products. I think he's just got busy doing whatever he does, possibly. I've not heard anything from him recently, so... Yeah, I mean, um, my key thing is to get that working in a black edge format. That's that's quite important for me because I have a number of boards that I want to put that in. So I can offer that out. Uh, I've got a tile version. I need to talk about tiles at some point as well, which is like my industrial carrier. Um, at the moment, what I will probably do on the, I don't know if the industrial stuff's much interest to you, Laurie, but uh, the tile structure is a way of, um, may, maybe if I get a chance, I don't know if it'd be next week, because I was going to do some, maybe some NMIGEN stuff next week. But uh, the tile stuff is a, is a more robust IO connection system. Um, the trouble is with things like, um, I don't have any here, damn, um, with P mods, you don't get much in the way of mechanical stability. So quite a lot of the stuff that I do, um, is to do with things like, um, automation, uh, robotics, motor control. Uh, that kind of stuff and sometimes you just need things that are a bit more um, physically stable so tiles is a kind of way of connecting things together that gives mechanical stability as well as expansion I don't know if I've I might have tweeted about it in the past or mentioned it um, but I'm going to um, introduce there will, will definitely be a tile solution based around the ECP5 Black Edge board. Um, but one of the things that I'm also looking at doing in the interim period is um, is an ICE 40 version. It won't have as many tiles, obviously, but it'll be quite a good entry level one and good for people to get. Um, get some experience with using that architecture at low cost um, let me just quick I, I can quickly if I can find it I can quickly show you what a tile solution looks like I did do a um, whew, so if I can find it I did do a, a black ice version at some point I don't know if I've got a copy on this machine Bear with me. Uh, where would I put that? G -g 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 -g. Um, hmm. Uh, 
Bear with me a sec. I must have something somewhere on here. Um, I might be able to show you a tile. Hold on. So this is one of the daughter boards. Oh, this one is not finished actually. That, that's not a very good one. Hold on. No. Last one I opened. There you go. So this 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 board, which was is half done, because uh, I've been working on this one. This is a tile. So th this is a peripheral board. Okay. In this case, this is a free access uh, controller board. Um, for uh, step of a based motion control in this case, based around the Trinamic, one of the Trinamic uh, chipsets, um, and importantly, so you've got the the connections up here are really your I/O and analog signals. So this is what the connector looks like. Uh, and it's basically an arrangement of, you have, I believe from memory, it's eight um, digital IOs, two analog IOs, SBI with an individual, which is shared amongst the tiles, plus an individual SPI. Oh, sorry, forgive me. Here I am gabbling away, and you can't even see what I'm looking at. So this is a tile, okay? Uh, they don't have to be, you know, for industrial or for um, motion control or something. They can be anything. But um, I wonder if I can make this a bit bigger, actually. Hold on. There we go. So the idea between the, the key ideas behind a tile are you have the digital I.O. Sorry, the I.O. is on the top left here. And that's normally on either a through hole 0.1 inch dual row uh, eight or 16 in total connector. Or a, or a through hole or a surface mount pointing downwards underneath the board. So we're looking at it from the top view. Um, and it's a standard pinout. So you have eight um, general purpose IOs connected to the FPGA. Then you have uh, an SPI, which can either be connected to the um, FPGA, but it's normally just connected to the microcontroller. With an individual board select tile select pin um, that enables it to do things like setup and stuff, and then above that you have like power, three volt, uh, and ground logic ground. You also have two analog signals uh, per tile, and I think there's a request signal as well. Hold on. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Mm -hmm. It's either a request or a reset. I can't remember off the top of my head. Bus request. So, um, in some ways, it's similar to a P mod, a double P mod, but with two analogs and an extra SBI and chip select. But one of the key things here is the way that the power is handled. So that's your kind of low voltage section, if you like. 
but here on these connectors these pads these are screw in connectors and they go through um, hexagonal uh, spaces effectively um, either aluminium or brass or something and they carry the high power signals uh, so for example this is particularly important if you're doing something like motor control where you need to deal with a lot of current um, so you can separate that side of the board and there is a distribution mechanism on the base tile carrier board that distributes the uh, the uh, high current signals and it's, it makes it better when you're doing like particularly with things like um, motor control particularly with brushless motor control where you need a lot of current uh, but if you're doing servos, steppers, certainly if you're doing brushless, you, you, you need that kind of capacity. Uh, and that's what's always very badly done. In the advice. But it, as well as giving you the high current path, um, it gives you mechanical stability because these boards are literally screwed down. Which is kind of cool. And then they all tessellate. So let me see if I can open. I did create a. Um, ooh, let me think. There's tiles. I did create a carrier for black ice. Uh, so you can see how they fit together. Uh, where will I put that? yeah robotics is fun right i love robotics that's where I, that's where i make my bread and butter basically designing electronics you know microcontroller and fpgas to control all sorts of motion stuff um, there's another application that I was working on that's very interesting, commercial one or semi-commercial one. Right, let me. I've got. I don't know. If this, this isn't the. Uh, this isn't the um, machine that I normally use to do this work on. So, some of these folders are very confusingly named. No, it's not that one. I can't even remember what I called this damn thing, whether I've got a copy on here. Uh, I don't know, maybe I'll put it in black edge folder hold on because i don't think it's in here well no, that's the black edge repository no, it's not what we want. Just bear with me, folks. Being disorganized here. E5 Maybe it was in here. What's the most recent one? Six of the night. Oh, are they all six of the night? 
That's interesting. No. Uh. Damn. Hmm. Ajax. I wonder if I've actually got it on here. It's annoying. Motion tiles. Oh, something completely different. Damn, if I can find it, that's annoying. Sure, I had a local couple. Dates on the 16th of the, oh, that might. There we go. So this is one of the tile carriers, interim tile carriers. So this this is based around Black Edge, but I think it was based for, around the um, um, Ice Core. Not around the amalgam, not around the ECP5 version. The I think the ECP5 Black Edge board supported something a, a lot, a lot more tiles. I think it was like six or seven tiles it would support. Maybe even, maybe even eight tiles. So. Um, in this case here, so in the center you've got what was ice core. Um, uh, basically, um, that separated from the black ice um, base carrier. And you're replacing it effectively with this big board here, which I think is uh, 150 mil by 100 mil. And in there you can fit one, two, three, four, five tiles around it. Because each of the tiles is just less than 50 by 50 millimeters. They're like 48 by 48 from memory. So this is really just a carrier um, for an old version of the tiles, not 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 the latest rendition of the tiles. 
So it's mostly just routing. It, the board is mostly passive. There's a few other bits and pieces that you need to have on here. Uh, so these uh, diodes here, these are kind of unipolar uh, zorbs. Um, they help protect the uh, uh, the high current backplane from um, moving around too 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 much disturbance on in terms of noise and things and current spikes when you do when you're switching motors and large loads and inductive loads particularly it's very very noisy and you need to um, just using normal kind of capacitor type filtering isn't good enough what you need is really really fast surge su suppressors that can deal with quite high voltage spikes because you need to rein those in. They can wreak havoc otherwise between the different boards. So you have these basic, basically these orbs. They're kind of um, unipolar uh, diodes with breakdown voltages of like 36 volts or something, depending what 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 power plane that you're using. Um, and then the power plane actually screws into these here and then gets distributed. So, I mean, if you was to look at the power plane, hold on. Uh, oh, I've got it turned off. Bear with me. <sighs> I thought that was... Oh, am I looking in the wrong place? Set. There we go. Misc. Let's just turn that back on temporarily. It would drive me mad probably, but there you go. There, so you've got a multi-layer plane. So it's actually a four-layer board. So really the top and bottom surfaces of this board are solid, uh, solid copper for moving around the high current stuff. And all of the... Uh, digital and analog signals are sandwiched between them on the inner layers effectively barring a few underneath the um, black edge board uh, and the I don't know if you can see it here the planes are actually separated maybe this is an older version where it doesn't show that but uh, yeah you can see a bit of separation here you've got a kind of central ground plane here that separates the black edge from the outer power bus um, but the key thing is once you put these tiles on it clamps down and then you have these uh, the, the IO connectors here and then you screw in from the top the um, into the board and that makes connection for the current but it also physically holds the board down so particularly if you're working on things like motors and stuff vibration can be a uh, uh, you know big problem yes you have diverted me Laurie but I don't mind <laughs> I don't know. I haven't had any feedback from anyone else. Does anyone else like this stuff? I can carry on talk a bit more about it if you like. Otherwise, I'll switch back to Alloy. Uh, make yourself heard, guys. Ed? This is probably not of interest to you, is it, Ed? <laughs> Anyhow, I will be doing some more on that stuff in a separate stream. That's all right. No problems, Ed. As I said before, just watch when it's interesting for you let me get back to um, where we were with alloy hold on because we need to do some work on this but anyhow so the tiling thing is really good for like uh, automation and control uh, and that's definitely one of the target markets for the amalgam version of the product one of the things that you do need is um, you know if you're doing many many different motors then it's um, you know multi-axis control particularly with things like brushless is uh, 
tricky stuff and you need some real bandwidth to do it. Mm -hmm. Okay, here's a question then, Ed, whilst you're online, and maybe Laurie. Um, so if you look at the Dazzler stuff that I showed you earlier that James has done, um, the advantage of that is having the GPU. So rather than you worrying about doing primitives yourself, you're offloading that into a separate chip. Um, would a retro system using that chip be of interest to you, Ed, and maybe Laurie? If we were to go down that route, because it's something that Ken and I are looking at. It's an interesting, um, interesting route. It's definitely useful for if you want to improve, you know, get decent output video wise from low power processors. I thought you'd say that, Laurie. Laurie said he's interested in writing his own GPU. I would love to do that as well. However, I'm not entirely sure I'm going to find the time to do it myself. But, um, yeah. And that's exactly what James did. That That's his bag. I think he used to work, uh, Ken said he used to work at um, NVIDIA many, many moons ago. Uh, and that that graphics chip that he or GPU that he designed was for FTDI, so you know that was like a commercial contract. So he knows his stuff. He's also really into fourth as well, which I think is how um, Ken knows him. He wrote like a Verilog fourth machine in like a hundred lines of Verilog or something, which was very impressive. What <laughs> you worked at Nvidia, Ed? Where? What did you? What did you do there then? I know nothing. <laughs> I'm assuming that James did actually work on the GPU side of things. <laughs> I'm gonna have to get some water. Hold on a sec. My folks a bit joined with me. to style myself as engineering support. <laughs> okay. We all need support, mate. We definitely all need support. So, um, I mean... I'd be interested in your thoughts, guys, if, in ideas-wise. I mean, Ken and I are definitely interested in doing something in the retro space, particularly with the graphics acceleration. Um, and the GPU looks like a quick way of getting there. So, um, you know... The trouble is when you're using microcontrollers, those cycles get eaten up very quickly. Um, and you just can't afford to use them often on the um, on dealing with graphics and stuff. So having a, either an FPGA do the heavy lifting for you or a GPU. Uh, in the case of what... What James has done there, he's using a combination. So the GPU does the heavy lifting of the graphics, 
and then the FPGA does the uh, um, basically the digital serialization to a more modern standard. That's what he's using the Spartan 6 for because it can drive the HDMI. I think, you know, that's probably why he's chosen that chip. This is not my first choice. But he's, he, you know, having it supported by the open tools probably isn't, you know, a high priority for him. Um, GPU really is just offloading any of the, you know, graphics tasks. Um, so it can be, there's things like moving sprites around, moving objects around on the screen. It can be drawing primitives triangles and things if you're doing 3d you know then it's you know drawing the mesh and then it's textures and things like that as well there are lots of tricks that can be used that mean that you're not transferring as much information between you know the microcontroller and and, and the um, gpu so you basically load up all the stuff first. It holds it in flash, has a frame buffer, and then the GPU does the heavy lifting of moving stuff around on the screen. It's, particularly if you're doing gaming, most of what's going on on the screen is just moving stuff around, right? Scrolling, moving, shifting, sprites, you know, relative movement, that kind of thing. Um, not necessarily talking about 3D games here, just the, even just you know 2D stuff, um, and that's a lot of work for a microcontroller to do. You know that it's not really optimized for. But equally, you could do it inside an FPGA to a degree. Yeah, I mean, I'm not an expert, um, both Ed, well, no, Ed's talking about the SNES graphics handling and the way that that's done. Um, you often find, you know, uh, graphics helpers, at least, in games. So you, you normally see a combination of devices in there, you know, in order to get the performance that you want. You know, because graphics can lead your main controller, you know, to crawl uh, if you're not careful. So offloading that either GPU or FPGA or combination thereof is a good idea. So I'm definitely interested in that sort of stuff. So yeah, any thoughts you get on that, do let me know, because Ken and I are interested in pursuing that that avenue. Um, and we may do something just using James's module to start with, but we can home in on something more particular later. Particularly something based around the open source tools would be lovely. Yeah. Now I'm not sure which features are in there. Um, there may be certainly some basic shading. I wouldn't wouldn't wonder. But I don't know if we're talking about things like texture maps. That's that's a bit more to it. Often you need more memory as well for those sorts of things. Yeah. Well, it's not just about the speed of SRAM, it's simplicity really. Um, Ed's talking about using SRAM rather than DDR RAM. Um, yeah, you, you do need a certain amount of fast, simple to access memory. Um, having to wait around for um, memory refresh and stuff is um, is painful.
Gigatron. Uh, is that the really basic um, TTL thing? Is that the TTL computer you were talking about? This one? Um, let me just put it up. Hold on. Ed? Yeah. Um, I don't know the chap's name. Ken knew him, but he died recently. He was rather ill. But I think they're um, they're still um, running it. Marcel, yes, thank you. From Belgium. He um, I think it was quite. I I don't think it was completely unexpected, but um. He'd been ill for a while, but I think it suddenly got worse. I don't know much about it. I Ken knew him quite well and worked in, in with his community and stuff. It's an amazing thing. And I know Ken's working on some TTO stuff that's very interesting. But that's all, you know, when you're talking about that kind of graphics, you're doing it all, all the heavy lifting yourself. It doesn't actually do much for you. VRAM, MISPRAM, SRAM, SDRAM, and DDR in order of difficulty for retro. Yeah. Uh, obviously choosing the right, um, I mean, it depends what resolution you want. If you want a lower resolution, um on the open source side then um there are some choices um i wonder if hyper ram would be fast enough depends what you're trying to do with it i guess but that's one possibility You know, in pseudo RAM. Uh, yeah, well, retro computing was based on direct memory access and manipulation. Sweet 16, yeah, that's what he's working on. Anyhow, so there may be some action in that general direction. So any ideas or features that you're interested in seeing, let even myself or Ken know, because it's something we are actively pursuing. Okay, right. Wow. We've already been streaming nearly hour and 50 minutes barring the interruption yes yeah, so you can design stuff from the ground up so that it that the graphics is functional and optimized definitely I mean, it'd be interesting to see what you can do with the the up 5K as well. I know it's got fairly limited resources. Um, and you can't do HDMI directly. You'd have to. I mean, you could you you could use a PMOD based VGA and stuff or an LCD or an external PMOD HDMI. Um, I'm not sure what speed you get. I don't know what retro stuff has been ported onto uh, the up 5k. I think you've you've got about 128k internal SRAM plus some embedded BRAM.
So you could do um, low res LCT type displays. Laurie says driving HDMI from icebreaker is fine. Um, in what way are you talking about using an external P mod to do the HDMI, Laurie? Not driving the HDMI directly from the IO on the UP 5K, are you? Using the P mod, yeah. So, did were you using the um, 24 bit one, i.e., the quad? mod to drive the HDMI from the UP5K on Icebreaker. Yeah. Because um, um, I do have a design for Alloy. Once this board's done, I've got another design for Alloy that's um, that could have a mix mod on it directly. Which would support that. Um, because you need the quad if you want 24 bit. I don't know how many colors did you need for the um, could you do it? Would it work with like an 8 bit doing the um. N N E S a HDMI wing for the orange crab. Yeah, no prob said if you've got other stuff to do, don't worry. The, the only other thing I was gonna do is just go through the um rework from Rev A to Rev B. I'm not gonna have to, time to do it all now anyhow. Um, I can do that at my leisure tomorrow. But I was just going to talk about the changes briefly before I go. Um, you can pick up on those later, Ed. Um, so, yeah, how many do you actually need? How many pins do you actually need, Laurie, to do the HDMI? I know it's a quad um, P mod, but does it use all of the pins? 12 bit. What for the orange crab? Is that what they're looking at? 12 bit. But how many IO pins do they need? The orange crab's okay because the ECB5 is fast enough to drive the HDMI directly. Oh, for the icebreaker, it's 12 bit. Oh, okay. I was thinking that was 24 bit. Are you, or are you saying that the um, the single the dual P mod one is twelve bit? I get confused, which is which. So for the icebreaker, what is that? Is that the um, quad P mod, i.e. the double connector? Probably on his site. Hold on. Uh, one, oh, one bit squared. It's his site, isn't it? Oh, I put I in there. Uh, European store. Uh, I'll just take English, please. Oh, it doesn't need translating. I've got a button. Store. Oh, hold on. There's the icebreaker. There's the orange crab. P mod panel driver. Oh, I can't see it on there. Hold on, did I go right past it? 
hyper uh, oh here we go dv interface 12 bit per pixel no you're quite right I'm, for some reason i thought it was 24. um must be using all the pins and by the looks of it so that would be 16 you need 16 ios to do that but i think the other one we looked at was that um it was just a double p mod so it used eight pins but presumably that was less it was like eight bit or whatever that was um bkl's board how many bits do you need for the nes kevin oh, don't know what's going on. Yeah, he doesn't show the um, the other one on here anymore. Four bit per color. This is Laurie's code. And that's using this P mod. Oh, look, there's a choice four bits per pixel. Wait. You got a four bits, a twelve bits, or a twenty-four bits. Hey. So when I'm selecting these, is that changing the board then? What does it say here? Now if you're looking for the twenty-four bit DDRP mod or the four bit P mod. They will be listed on this product page as a variant as soon as we have them. Send the message via the contact form. So, by the looks of it, they do three different versions. I didn't know that. So, the four bit version is that the just double P mod? And then the other two are quad P mods, I guess. Mm. Okay. I did notice actually, um, there's one other interesting area. Um, let me tell you who I should have covered this in community news, but given that I'm not going to have time to do all the CAD today, um, why not tackle this? Let me just bring up Pepin's. Pepin's working on some good stuff. Project Akipolka. 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 Uh, let me find. Let me find his Twitter. Okay. Uh, so his Twitter is this. Um, you should definitely follow him. Uh, let me give you some other links to stuff. He's you can he's got you can sponsor him on GitHub. Let 
He also has a Patreon page. Um, and the project that he's working on that's of interest to us is this. Uh, Apicula, sorry. Project Apicula. And it's basically to support the um, GoWin FPGAs. Uh, and because he's doing that now, hold on. There's also a patron page for him. So let's do the whole set. Where you can, you know, encourage him to get those chips supported. Uh, they're already supported in a light way, but not fully, not in a proper next PNR type way. He is trying to get it integrated into next PNR. Um, he's got a certain amount of the smaller stuff working. Um, I was just trying to find the name of the chips. Hold on. Let me get rid of this. Uh, hold on. He says here. Status. <laughs> go in. Go in parts. He's got the GW9, I think, is supported. And the GW... GW1NR9 and the GW1N1. Um, the 9, I think, is the more interesting one. Um, Project-wise, it's interesting because um, it, it adds another chip family in. But the um, one of the cool things is, uh, I was just following his stuff that he was working on recently and he just made a discovery now uh if you look at one of them i think it's a g go in gw9 hold on let's see if i can find it uh g gw1 n nine is it GWN1NR. So if we look at the specs for this, there's quite a bit of similarity to some of the lower end lattice I stuff. But there's some nice added features. I think it's, yeah, you can see it in this one. So for example, here, this one has lookups of uh, something like 86, 8,640. I think they're, yeah, they're, they're LUT fours, just like the lattice stuff. In fact, I mean, the company was started by a bunch of people that used to work at Lattice, but don't quote me on that. But what is interesting here is if you look, Shadow RAM, which is SRAM, it's got uh, 17K, as well as the block RAM. But I think he was poking around recently, and um, what we found out is that inside the the chip the um i don't know it's this one it's the one with ps ram here there look at 64 megabits or is it megabytes crikey they're not specific here but the um, embedded ps ram turns out to be a windbound Part. and we worked out what it was which is an interesting thing and it's actually hyper ram they're using hyperbus so it's a hyperbus chip probably a, it's either a wafer scale integration or it could be a separate die that's included in the package but it's it's a separate oemd either die or wafer scale integration to create this 
So it's a very interesting chip. And these, strangely, you, 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 it was really difficult to get these before, but now they're available at Mauser, I believe. Uh, oh, it's not my type at all. Mauser. Uh, GW1NR. Oops. So you can actually buy these chips now at Mauser. Pricing is not that good. If you want decent pricing, you'd need to talk to them directly, although I expect um, if you spoke to Mauser, you might get some better pricing as well if you've got contact there. So that particular chip we're talking about, it is the same one I think that we were just looking at. They charge, I've got it in pounds here, which isn't helpful for comparison purposes. So that's a $20 chip. Uh, you could probably get it significantly less than that if you bought a decent quantity, I reckon. But you've got this PS RAM 64 mega PS RAM bit. It doesn't give you the details here. Maybe if I click on the data sheet. Or is this a generic one for the entire range? Isn't, isn't there like a feature list somewhere? Wow, what is this? I've just opened It's not much of a data sheet. That's strange. Product data sheet. Oh. Right, it's going to be around the garden path, I'm afraid, guys. Well, I'll wind it in slowly. Crikey. Such a rapid sight. Sorry, I'm hungry, folks. I haven't really eaten much tonight. Oh, how frustrating is that? So in terms of the packages, this is available in QN88, QFN88, or an LQ144, which is what was interesting to me. So at one point I thought, if the code could be done, if it could be ported, to the open source tools next PNR, it will be a good target for Black Ice. That combination of memory is fairly interesting. Because you've got VRAM, SRAM, and pseudo PFRAM, which is kind of cool. You need to, I think you have to use JTAG. Certainly, currently to program it, I don't think you can use. I don't. I'm not I'm not sure it's got something like an SPI um, SPI type programming. And that bottom package, the MG eighty one, is the um, PGA. Can't believe it doesn't show the detail of that on here. Really annoying. Hold on, my cat wants to come in. Come on, Sparks. Are you 
There's nobody giving you any attention in there. Um, mm, it's annoying. No, what is this says? Features. Oh, this is a bit better. Um, they claim some quite high end features here. What they're talking about. Oh, I believe they've got MIPI support, which is very interesting. I don't know how extensive that support is, but that's useful. Um, Dock room. Sparkles. Oh, look, there's a list. Hey, is no one giving you any attention in there? Have you come to see me? And my streaming friends? Meow. Yeah. The trouble is they can't see you when you stand there. All they see is me stroking. Hold on. I don't think I can easily move that. Can move it a little bit. Look. Can you just see sparkles? Our oh, poor skinny diabetic cat. Hmm. That's always hungry, like a dog, aren't you? Hmm. Not like your sister. Just goes off sleeping somewhere. Um. I don't know if that's of any interest to you, Laurie. From the game's point of view, if you're still watching, that specification. Oops, sparkle's gone out into the garden. Because you've got this different layers of memory that you can use. So, is it more specific here? GWN9. Hmm. Yeah. Plus is. That says 128 meg bits, which is 16 megabytes of the PS RAM. But as I say, internally, that's a hyperbus connected. Um, 16 megabytes, but you've got SRAM. 64 megabits, so that's 8 megabytes. Plus, you've got some block RAM as well. Um, k bits. So, it's an interesting chip. Um, and now that uh, Pep has been um, funded via Patreon and stuff, and the more people fund him, the more it'll get done. So that's kind of cool. We've got that to look forward to. Uh, and they make quite a few different chips. But that one's particularly interesting because of the way that the memory is arranged. That could be one possible future retro platform um you can you might be able to drive i don't know can you drive hdmi from that directly hmm. i don't know what the mippy would do whether you could drive dp from that or is it just MIPI camera in type support? Or it might just be parallel MIPI, of course. Point zero, point two. Hmm. Anyhow, something of interest. Something to keep an eye on. And do sponsor 
Pepe because he's doing some good work. He's also doing it in a very interesting way. He he's done a lot of um, he's done some streams if you want to watch them. Um, anyone that thinks my streams might be long and boring, his are even longer and more boring because he's literally fuzzing the inside of these chips, trying to work out what's connected to what, which MUX registers control what things. But more recently, he's decided to start doing it a different way. Rather than, he, he tends to use Python to do it, but rather than just do it on the command line, he started using Jupyter Notebooks. I don't know if anyone's used Jupyter Notebooks. I've used it. I use it for doing a lot of Python image processing and uh, modeling and machine learning and stuff like that. But um, it's basically, so what you can do, you can, you can effectively build up a notebook, an interactive notebook page. Uh, you don't have to use Python, by the way, but that's what I've historically used. Um, so that you actually got a recording of what you're doing and it's in a, it's mixed with markdown and markup and that kind of stuff. So you've got a much more presentable, you know, explanation for what you're working on and stuff. So that's really cool what he's doing there. And that, that helps provide a bit more insight into the process of fuzzing fuzzing these uh, FPGA chips so that you can uh, understand how the how the bit bit controls and the bit images are um, need to be assembled what the internal structure of the muxes and features and LUTs are but please do uh, yeah sponsor him on Patreon or GitHub or something the more sponsorship he gets, the sooner we'll get access to these chips, which is really cool. Um, let me briefly, I've got a little bit of time left, 10 minutes maybe. Um, so let me talk about quickly what we're going to do change wise on Alloy. So if just to remind you what it looks like. Oh. I don't know if I can open the old one. So the previous version, what did that look like? Hold on. Maybe I can open the um, older one. That's what it looked like before. Um, So that was what produced that kind of the ice core version of alloy if you like um, and this bit in particular is being changed so I had the FPGA pins on here and no FPGA pins on the normal feather pins so one of the changes that I'm making on here is I'm actually putting some of the FPGA pins on the feather pins on the top. So if we go back to the alloy board, there's a couple of reasons for doing this. Um, one is to make the board size the same as the original feather size. Even though you are allowed to expand it that way, it just means it fits in. But it means if you've got feather peripherals, you can actually drive some of them from the FPGA. So it doesn't make any sense doing the bottom pins in this way because you've got analog pins there which you can't drive uh, from the up 5k and then you've got SPI and UART. Well you can do that from the microcontrollers. You, you don't gain any advantage using the um, FPGA to do that. Hold on. I just realised I'm not showing you guys. There you go. And let me just remind you, sorry what the old one looked like yes it's longer that's this one one I'm prototype now that's the rev a so the rev b that i'm working on now is slightly shorter and as i say 
So the lines at the top here, apart from the SCL and STA, which will remain controlled by the ESP32, uh, these these lines here are FPGA controlled. There's seven of them, right? Yeah, one, no, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So those will be FPGA pins on the top. And the slight rearrangement of the existing pins. Um, in order to support some of the same um, same circuit Python peripherals, so um, so that's the first change. The pins that were on there are now being used for other purposes. So, for example, one of the pins is used for a one-bit memory, which is a weirdity to circuit Python, so that it can detect whether it's been reset before or not. Um, and then you've got things like battery monitoring and stuff as well. Um, the other thing I've added onto the bottom here, and you can't see it, this is going to be an interesting one. Let me just pull it on. I knew I shouldn't have turned that on. That's annoying. Let me just turn it off for us. I remember. Otherwise, you have to do this all the time. There's no quick key for this, or not on this version. So on the bottom. So underneath the power connector here, on the bottom, I've added one of these. Oops, wrong one. Now that is a quick connector or a, what Adafruit call it. That's Spark Fun call it a quick connector. Adafruit call it a uh, stemmer four pin connector. They have a three pin and a four pin. Basically, it's just I squared C. But people like Spark Fun and Adafruit have loads of peripherals that support these, these standards. So, you know, you can get the cables and you get these like little OLEDs and accelerometers and God knows what else. And um, they just hook up and you can daisy chain them because they're I squared C devices, assuming you don't run out of addresses, of course. So I'm using a couple of the pins for that. Those are directly controlled from the ESP32 obviously and the battery monitoring voltage I've got a battery charger chip on there but I can actually read the voltage directly and the one bit memory and what am I using I'm using one of them to blink one of the LEDs because it really annoys me on the development board if you don't have an LED you can blink so um, that uses all of those up which is good uh, the other thing I've got to do is uh, some. I'm starting on things like some of the optimization for manufacturing. So um, these two diodes, for example, will be replaced by this one. Uh, that's one less part, takes up slightly less room. I am considering adding these two in to do level shifting for the uh, quick connector, but I might not bother, frankly. You have to be a bit careful because it carries a 5 volt supply on that connector. Uh, the LEDs will change as well. So at the moment I've got three LEDs down here that are separate. Those are being replaced by this one. It's a lovely little 1 mil squared RGB LED and that will fit in there and then I'll shove this up a little bit up there. And then this RGB LED will also be moved, uh, replaced by one of these as well. 
and I'll lose the charge LED there because it will all be done by this. So one of the one of the colors in here will be charge, which will be blue. The green will be power. So normally powered, it's green, and then charge status, it will be bluish or blue green. And then the other one is for an indicator, so you can do a blinky, and that will make it flash between whatever the power status is and white. Um, so that's that optimization. Uh, if I have issues with the quick connector on the bottom here, I can also put a vertical one where the open source hardware symbol is as well. So I was toying with the idea because I can move, crush some of this up a little bit, squeeze it up because I'm not using all of this space as efficiently. Um, the other thing I'm changing is the way that the boot pin is connected won't be exposed on that pin it will be exposed on the bottom pin here um, and it won't be routed to the led which it currently is and it won't be routed to dumb the internal dumb pin will be routed to the internal signal called bqs which can be used either as a strobe uh, when doing the spy transmissions or the other way around it could be used for signaling Things like memory full or, or I need more. I, I will accept more data. It could be used as a handshake signal. So when it's not being used as done, it can be used as that. So I've got that change. I've also got to rectify the uh, antenna feed signal, obviously. Um, and then over in this corner, so what will probably happen is another one of these LEDs will set. Oops. That will probably sit over here. I might be able to fit it in here. And then I've got a, another resistor array that's got to go over here and a capacitor for the one bit memory. So it's a minor change, really, minor set of changes. But um, I want to try and get that done this week and then order in the new PCBs. I need to do it quite quickly because. I can't test the Wi-Fi properly with this board because of that issue. So I kind of need to step on it a bit because I need to get this board out, really. So that's the changes I was going to work on this evening, but it doesn't matter. I can work on that tomorrow. We've had fun talking about other interesting stuff anyhow. Uh, there's also a bit of a change. I've added uh, a bit more capacitance onto the supply side. Um, on the three volt side around the ESP for the VDDA, which is used for the transmission. It does use some juice when it's when you turn the Wi-Fi on. Uh, I'm also seeing some uh, some real current pull on the VUSB, so I'm going to add a bit more um, capacitance on there as well. I actually got less than I thought I had on there. Um, so it's just some small changes really on there. When I was looking on the scope using the Wi-Fi, um, I didn't see any free volt free dip. I did see a little bit of noise, a few spikes. The free volt free seemed to hold up hold up well. Um, the VUSB was dipping by about half a volt, 500 millivolts, which was surprising. But it's still more than enough overhead for the uh, low dropout regulators I've got on board. So that wasn't upstream that wasn't causing any issues. Uh, and the reason I, I was looking at that is because I had the Wi-Fi problems. I was just wondering whether um, it wasn't getting enough juice to do the um, Wi-Fi properly. Um, and it was. Although looking at the power rails, I figured I could put in a little bit more um, more decoupling and well not decoupling so much a bit more reservoir capacitance really and i might add some smaller caps if i can fit them in like a 100 pf here and there to get rid of i did notice some fairly high frequency stuff when i started using the radio part not anything to worry about but just keep the noise levels down so that's me really this evening. Um, sorry we went slightly off track, but you know, um, watching me do CAD probably a bit boring anyhow, quite frankly. 
uh, and we had some interesting conversations. Um, it's slightly different from what I originally planned, partly because Ken uh, called me up yesterday or the day before to talk about the Dazzler stuff and the GPU. So it's good to talk about some of that. Uh, and I'm sure we talk more about some of that on the forum, etc. If you've got any more questions, please do join us on the forum. Uh, also, following us on um, on Twitch is a good idea as well. As I say, if I get quite a few followers, they might actually keep my streams. I do keep local copies and upload them to YouTube. That's going to be fun this week, given that we broke halfway through. I'll have to work out how to tie those two together. But anyhow, listen, thanks for your time, guys. Um, I will be streaming again next week. What I was planning on doing was maybe covering the NMyGen support for this board, going through writing the NMyGen support, just touching base on that, if that's of interest. If there's anything anyone wants to see, let me know. There's a thread in the forum. Uh, let me point to that right now where I normally comment on the stream stuff. All things my storm stream. Um, worth looking at that. And if you have anything that you want to see in the stream or you want me to cover, or if you want any questions, um, pop it in down there. And I'll, 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 I'll notice that in time for next uh, Wednesday. And make sure it's on my um, list of things to cover. Otherwise, if you want to talk about any of the MyStorm stuff, obviously, there's lots of other threads on the forum which are quite interesting as well. But listen, thanks, guys. I will see you all um, next Wednesday if I don't speak to you in between. Thanks. Ciao.